the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Elliot Haynes, an editor of United Nations World. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Ernest A. Gross, United States Deputy Representative to the United Nations. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Ambassador Gross, I'm sure that many of our audience remember your appearance on this show three or four months ago. Since then, a great deal has happened, and I'm sure that our audience would appreciate your views tonight on what's being accomplished at the United Nations. Now, sir, as a first question, uh, do you believe that there is more support in the United States for the United Nations today or less than there was at your last appearance? Well, I've just come back from Paris uh, from the, where the meeting of the General Assembly just concluded. I've been back just a, a few days. I would say that uh, there is less support. There's less support and that means that there is a growing criticism in this country of the United Nations? That's my impression. Ambassador Gross, do you believe that the reason for that is that the United Nations was oversold to Americans, that, it, that they were told that the UN would solve all problems overnight? I don't know whether I'd agree that it was oversold. I think that there were a great many hopes uh, that we had in 1945 and the world that existed then, which have turned out to be, to have been unfounded. And I think that the fact that, that, that all our hopes did not materialize, did not really come about, are, has uh, led to frustration. What are such hopes? Well, in 1945, uh, just after the war, we thought, I think a great many people all over the world thought uh, that uh, all the big powers, including the Soviet Union, would agree on peace treaties for Germany and Japan. Of course, the principal disillusionment has been the recalcitrance of Russia, has the 19th. Yes, I think the fact that the Soviet Union has not carried out its pledges, that the Soviet Union has violated the United Nations Charter, the fact that the Soviet Union has not cooperated with the rest of the world has led to the situation which exists today in the world. Well, now, do you think that at the last General Assembly, the failure of the Soviet Union to live up to its pledges, uh, pledges was revealed by United States uh, insistence on that point? I think that from 1945 until the present moment, the Soviet Union has been revealing itself in every meeting of the General Assembly and every United Nations meeting. I think that's one of the, advantage of the advantages of the United Nations. As a sounding board for... Uh, I think it's a place where every country can reveal and does reveal whether it's conscious or unconscious, where they show exactly what they're up to. Well, I, I mm -hmm. think our people generally uh, understand that the disillusionment about Russia. Now, what about our own nation? Have any actions by our own government contributed to disillusionment in the United Nations? Now, specifically on the Korean armistice, do you think that the the whole Korean matter has contributed to disillusionment in our country? Uh, I hope not. I hope not. I think that the attitude of the American people, if I can summarize it, as I see it at least, the attitude of the American people toward the United Nations has followed the ups and downs of the Korean War itself. I think that right after the aggression against uh, the Republic of Korea back in June 1950, there is a tremendous enthusiasm in this country for the United Nations and for the fact that the United Nations decided to stop aggression in Korea. I think after the Chinese communists came into the war, and as General MacArthur said at that time, a new war had started, I think that uh, there was a great deal of disillusionment and disappointment in the fact that the United Nations had not 
carried the war to a successful well, conclusion. Well, now, do you think that the United Nations can carry the war to a successful conclusion within a reasonable period? I think that that uh, decision is for the communists. I think that the United Nations has won a great victory in Korea. I think that the American people and the rest of the world understands that aggression was brought to a halt in Korea. The now, Republic of Korea is a country today. On this question of American disillusionment, which seems particularly interesting to me, sir, uh, do you think that much of our disillusionment in Korea has been caused by the fact that some of our allies have seemed to be rather reluctant? Yes, I think that there has not been enough of a contribution of military forces by our allies. I think we have felt that from the very beginning. You, you think then that that disillusionment, that criticism, of, among our own people has been justified. It is true that some of our allies have been too reluctant, have in effect let us down in Korea. Yes, I think well, now so. How, how can you say that when uh, the French and the British are carrying on wars almost the same size as the Korean War in uh, Indochina and in Malaya? Well, there are 60 members of the United Nations. Now, I don't want to, uh, to seem to be running down the contributions which the French and the British, or you've named them, have been making in the general battlefront against communism in the world. The French have had astounding losses in Indochina, where they've been carrying the war against communism. The British have been making sacrifices in Malaya and in Southeast Asia generally. I'm not referring to any particular countries when I make the statement I do, but the United Nations effort in Korea should be a collective effort. Mm -hmm. And I am certain, I'm certain that more contributions mm -hmm. can be made by many more countries than have come into the war in Korea. Now, Mr. Gross, uh, even though that disillusionment among us uh, has grown, the United Nations still has an enormous amount of goodwill extended toward it by the American people. A lot of us still have our hopes fastened on it. Now tonight, can you point to some specific things that have happened that should encourage us uh, about the United Nations? Well, of course, I think that, the, uh, that what I've just been saying about the failure of uh, many of our allies to send greater forces to Korea, or to send forces at all, has to be weighed and balanced against the fact that there are 16 nations fighting in Korea, that the United Nations has stemmed the aggression against the Republic of Korea, that if the Korean ent enterprise had not been undertaken, the Republic of Korea would have been overrun, and I have the slightest doubt in the world that the communists regarded Korea as part of a master plan of aggression. In other now, words, um, you, you would point to Korea. You think that an objective judgment should be that Korea is a plus for the United oh, States. Oh, I think, it's, I think it's one of the, it, we turned a historic corner when we decided to stop the aggression. Can now. you point to a second plus now? Yes, I think so. The, the, the whole question of the position of countries within the free world is something we often lose sight of because we're naturally concerned about the greatest menace of all, which is the menace of communist imperialism. But let's not forget that some of the greatest successes of the United Nations in the past have been in settling disputes within the free world. I mean, I'll just cite three examples of that. The United Nations stopped a war in Palestine. They stopped a war in Indonesia between the Dutch and a now what is a new nation of 70 million people born under the auspices of the UN. The UN stopped a war between India and Pakistan uh, in Kashmir. Well, now those are, those are very impressive uh, achievements, and I think the American people are, are justifiably proud of them. But you must admit that the overwhelming question of the day is the battle between the free world and the slave world. And uh, one of the purposes of the UN was in providing a, an area where those two major powers could bit by bit come to agreement, thereby avoiding war. Now, during the last assembly that you've just returned from, was there any uh, even slight reaching of an agreement which might portend uh, a greater agreement in the future. Well, I feel myself that the, that the uh, last assembly, which, and we mustn't forget that every year there is the great international conference of 60 nations. We call it a general assembly, but it's really an important international conference. And we mustn't forget that, um, there, that you can judge the state of the world by what happens at those international conferences. The Russians, I think, were definitely on the defensive at this last session of the assembly. I think they're on the defensive in the world today. Was uh, Vyshinsky's notable failure that he made a laughing stock out of him over there, one of the, that uh, 
Well, I, I don't want to comment picture. about Vyshinsky's uh, failures or accomplishments. I think that, uh, uh, that uh, he has uh, accomplished more failures <laughs> and failed in more accomplishments yes. uh, than uh, people may generally realize. I think, however, that um, uh, he was on the defensive. I think the Soviet delegation was on the defensive, and they were put there by us. I well, think I that that was not anything that happened accidentally. Yes, but is that uh, reaching toward an, a, a, a final uh, agreement, an, an area of agreement between the two major powers? I think so. I think so, because I think that what the Soviet uh, leaders, what the Kremlin uh, needs uh, is a show of solid strength on the other side. And by strength, I don't mean armed might alone. I mean a solid attitude on the part of the rest of the world. I think we're getting that. I think we need the United Nations in order to get that. I'd just like to mention two points in that connection. In the first place, there are a great many small states in the world today whose existence depends upon having a forum to go into, being able to go to the UN. They're worried, many of them, about the threat from next door. Secondly, there is a tremendous economic problem in the world today. Two-thirds of the people in the world today are under an adequate, inadequate diet. They are suffering from nutritional diseases. The United Nations programs, through the World Health Organization, through the Food and Agriculture Organization, are making tremendous contributions in large areas of the world. Yeah, but Mr. Ambassador, I then believe that to sum up what you've said to our audience tonight, you think that in spite of all of our frustrations, that the American people should be patient and should and should and can still fasten hope on the United Nations that it will do something very constructive. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Elliot Haynes. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Ernest A. Gross, United States Deputy Representative to the United Nations. One of the virtues of our free enterprise system is the benefit to the public in better quality and lower prices, which spring from free and open competition. Now, certainly, the stimulus of such competition made it necessary to make Longines watches ever better and better. And it is through free and open competition that Longines became, in fact, the world's most honored watch. Honored for excellence and elegance, by 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 gold medals. Honored for accuracy by innumerable prizes and bulletins from the great government observatories. Honored for honesty in sports, aviation, exploration, and science. For superlative quality and true investment value, Longines watches have become the first choice of discriminating men and women in every country of the free world. So. If you wish to purchase a very fine watch, either for yourself or as a gift, look for the true worth in the watch you buy, and your choice will be Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.